Hello, everyone. Just going to wait a few minutes to let people come into the webinar. Okay, great. So I'm going to get started. Welcome to the Advocacy in Motion or AIM Grants Results uh, webinar. My name is Eliana Monteforte and I'm the Director for Special Projects at Global Health Council. Here at Global Health Council, we're a leading member organization devoted to advancing global health priorities by uniting advocates, implementers, policymakers, and other stakeholders. So we're excited to have our AIM grantees share the amazing work that they've been doing over the past year. Um, but first, I'd like to share a little bit more about what these AIM or Advocacy in Motion grants are all about. Right. So in the spring of 2021, we hosted with uh, the Civil Society Engagement Mechanism, a CSO summit. And at this summit, we brought together CSOs, government representatives, and other stakeholders to discuss health equity gaps that resulted from COVID specifically. But also at the summit, we facilitated a Health for All advocacy planning workshop to help civil society organizations turn advocacy into action. So all of the workshop participants became eligible to submit proposals for GHC's first ever AIM grants. Um, and the grant funding provided um, support for the development of health equity focused advocacy plans. So the grants were awarded to five grantees who work across Africa and Asia on numerous health areas, but most importantly, with some of the most vulnerable and often left behind communities, such as migrant workers, women and children, people living with disabilities, um, and youth, just to name a few. So we are now delighted to have our AIM grantees share what they've been up to um, this past year. So during this webinar, I'll have our speakers introduce their organizations and talk about the advocacy plans that they developed. So unfortunately, one of our grantees couldn't join us today, but um, we can still share information about the work that they did after this webinar. After this webinar, we'll also be sharing the recording um, where you'll be able to see the presentations again. Um, so after we have our presenters talk about their advocacy plans, we will have some time for question and answers. So attendees, you're welcome to ask any of our presenters questions, whether it be about the development of their advocacy plan, the process that they used, um, any specific questions, um, technical questions about the work that they're doing. Um, we will allow for questions in the Q&A box. So there's a chat function and chat box, and then there's also a Q&A box. So if you could please put your questions in the uh, Q&A box, that would be great. I will also monitor the chat box in case some go through there. Um, if we have a lot of questions, I have asked our presenters to answer some of those um, and others will be answering um, live. So, Without further ado, our first presenter is Isaac Nyampang. From, he's a program manager from the Alliance for Reproductive Health Rights and public health practitioner for over 15 years. So Isaac, I am going to start sharing my screen now. And as soon as you can see my screen, the floor will be yours. And if you can try to put um, video on, that would be great. Otherwise, if the video is disrupting connection, um, we can try just audio. Over to you, Isaac. 
Thank you, Eliana. So I'll present highlights of our advocacy plan. So the title of our plan was putting women at the center of primary health care. And um, it's it was designed by the Alliance for Reproductive Health Rights. The Alliance for Reproductive Health Rights, as the name suggests, is a membership-based organization in Ghana. We have over 40 members, and we are an advocacy group for women, children, and adolescents. Our mission is to ensure inclusive, responsive, accountable, and equitable delivery of health services through advocacy, research, and capacity building. Our um, vision is a society in which universal health coverage is achieved. Here we are looking at where every Ghanaian is able to access equitable health care without suffering any financial hardship or calamity. And we are also advocates for primary health care as a foundation pillar for health systems. In 2016, we realized that Ghana could not achieve most of its uh, Millennium Development Goals uh, targets. So we had to uh, redesign our strategies to begin to look at how we can strengthen the health system to be able to achieve the goals that uh, the MDGs, the SDGs actually uh, set forth. So we change our strategy to look at health systems strengthening and looking at primary healthcare as the foundation pillar to achieve that. In the more recent uh, years, in the last couple of, the last three years, we've been implementing projects in uh, other West African countries, such as Cote d'Ivoire, Senegal, Sierra Leone, Niger, and Burkina Faso. So back to the context of our advocacy plan. So Ghana, like I indicated, has shown commitment to achieving UAC uh, by the year 2030. And we have identified as a country two main uh, interventions or strategies to achieve that. And we have what we call the CHIPS and the National Health Insurance. The CHIPS is a community-based health planning and services. And essentially is the first point of contact with the health system. And uh, its purpose is to ensure that there's geographic access to health services. The national health insurance is also to provide financial risk protection for the population. So when you do an analysis of these two key strategies, we realize that, well, there are some provisions for women-focused services, but in terms of gender equity, it was not central to the delivery of these two interventions. So, for example, we realized that infrastructure and inputs that are required to addressing the needs of women are inadequate or is lacking. And one of them is contraceptive commodities. And if you look at the facility design itself, sometimes it doesn't provide the privacy and the confidentiality and other quality of care issues that women really face. So we, in our plan, we looked at focusing on having a specific budget line for maternal and reproductive health commodities. So we can have some level of accountability and be able to track uh, allocations to maternal and reproductive health. Well, so the objective for the plan was to get government or is to get government to set up a specific budget line for maternal and reproductive health commodities by the end of the year 2025. In Ghana, what usually happens is that there's a, there's a big pot of uh, allocation to health commodities. And sometimes it's difficult to track specific allocations to maternal health and reproductive health. So what we are asking for is for government to set up a specific budget line that allocations can be made for reproductive 
health and maternal health commodities. By doing so, we'll be able to advocate for consistent increase in the allocations to reproductive health and maternal health, and also be able to track uh, the allocations to ensure that the actual allocation is released and facilities are also getting what they are expected to get because government has made certain commitment and by way of accountability, we should be able to track what government has committed to do for women and children. So by the end of 2025, we expect to have a budget line specifically for set up for the procurement of maternal and reproductive health commodities by the government of Ghana. And like I indicated, this will enhance ac accountability in the allocation and use of resources because we'll be able to track how much is coming in, how much is going out. We can follow to the last mile to see uh, whether commodities are getting to where they are supposed to, to, to get to. And the women are also benefiting from these allocations and ultimately improve health outcomes for women and, and girls. And here we are looking at equitable access to quality uh, services for women and girls. Next steps. So we, we have integrated um, our plan into our broader vision and strategy for, for systems change. And as Alliance, we are, we are developing a systems change vision and strategy for the next uh, three years and with funding from co-impact. So we are integrating this uh, strategy into our broader vision and, and strategy. And the purpose of this is to ensure that we have a deeper understanding of the systems gaps and, uh, and the root causes of some of these challenges. We've been doing advocacy for quite a long time and a lot, uh, we have made minimum progress. So we just want to understand the, the system challenges and uh, also help us identify the, the key changes that we need to, to make at a system level and what it will require in terms of strategy to, to make sustainable change in, in the work we do. So essentially, this is what uh, we, we plan to do, as well as putting a good uh, winning coalition to be able to achieve the objective that we've set for ourselves to achieve. And yes, so we also uh, be looking for co-funding support to help in the implementation of our plan. Thank you. I was muted, sorry about that. Thank you so much, Isaac. Great that you um, are focusing on making sure women and girls are reaching quality health services, something obviously that's really important, especially after the pandemic where women and girls have been affected. Um, and really great that um, you're able to use this opportunity to think strategically about how your organization can make an impact on women and girls and incorporate this um, advocacy plan into the overall strategy and vision for your organization. Thank you so much for sharing. Um, so now I'd like to introduce Clinton Azigwe from the Christian Fellowship and Care Foundation, who's been a community and human rights activist for over nine years. So Clinton, the floor is yours. Let me just switch slides. And if you could just let me know when to change slides, that would be helpful. Thank you, Clinton, over to you. So, hi everyone. Um, so, um, I'll, oh, sorry, Alina, I think um, this one is the old slide, something. Oh, right. this is the, this the is the slide one. that I have, but if you have a, another slide deck that you want to use, you're welcome to share your screen. Okay, um, let me see. Let me do that now. Uh, Okay. 
Do you need help figuring out the share screen mode? Because we can always have um, someone else come on and you can email the, the newer ones to me if you'd like. Yeah, I'm trying to, okay. Um. Just a moment. Okay, so I'm going to share the screen now. Okay, go ahead. Oh, let's see. Oh, it's technology. Good. Are you able to share your screen? Yeah, it's processing right now. Okay, it might be uh, your connection. Maybe if you come off video, the it'll go through faster. Okay. What is happening? Why don't you, um, Christian, why don't you, I mean, sorry, Clinton, why don't you send me your slides? I'll just have someone else come on and then we can bring you back it back over. Okay. Okay, Good, thank great. you. I'm going to do that right now. Okay, so um, I'll just come back on video. Okay, so next let's have Musarat Parveen come in uh, from the regional network called Karam Asia. So at Karam Asia, um, Musarat is a regional coordinator and she's been working to advance health among, among migrant workers since uh, 2011. So Musarat, if you can come on video for us and I will share my screen again to put up your presentation. Can you see my slides Musarat? And you're on mute just in case you are trying to speak. Thank you, Aliana. I can see the screen. Uh, okay, thank you great. very much. I would like to thank you, Global Health Council, for organizing this important event. And uh, I would like to talk about Karam Asia's Universal Health Coverage Advocacy Plan for Migrant Workers in Asia. Next slide, please. Karamisha is actually, we are an NGO and we are regional network. We have 42 member organizations in 18 countries across Asia, including Middle East. And uh, Karamisha was established in 1997. And since that time, uh, it is promoting and protecting for the rights of uh, migrants, labor and health rights with focus on HIV and AIDS, uh, sexual and reproductive health rights and women migrants issues. And uh, we have four task forces to focus on key thematic areas, uh, which are migrant workers' rights. It includes migrant workers' human rights and labor rights. And then we have migration, health, HIV, and well-being task force. And then we have migration, development, and globalization. And the fourth one is migration and climate change task force. And all these task force members are comprised of our membership. Next slide, please. Karamisha's broader strategies are participatory action research. This is the area where we engage communities into the research process, and then we generate information, uh, uh, research reports to, to bridge the information gap. And then uh, we do advocacy at national, regional, and international levels for migrant workers, for the advancement of migrant workers' rights. And then we organized a lot of uh, capacity building uh, based on identified stakeholders and communities' needs. And we do undertake uh, media campaigns, publicity, and awareness raising activities to raise awareness on migrant workers, labor, and health rights. And number five is uh, enhancing, we work for enhancing access to services for migrant workers. This includes providing services to those who are in need, as well as uh, referring them for, for legal services and for health services as well. Uh, next slide, please. <laughs> Migrant workers uh, health problems under under uh, a M grant Karamisha has conducted research on universal health coverage for migrants in four South Asian countries and the findings suggest that there is a lack of recognition of migrant workers vulnerabilities to HIV and AIDS actually there are a lot of factors in migration process 
put migrant workers at high risk of contracting HIV, HIV and not only HIV, but other infections also, but all these uh, vulnerabilities are not recognized at policy level and practices level as well. So there is a lack of access to sexual health and reproductive rights for migrant workers, and there is a criminali criminalization of migrant workers in receiving countries where uh, migrant workers, they get arrested, detained, and deported if they are found with HIV infection or other health infections as well as pregnancy uh, for women. And once they get deported, uh, there are no mechanisms in place for returning or deported migrants uh, health checkups in sending countries when they go back. And there is not enough health budget overall and no allocations for migrant workers health rights. <clears throat> there is lack of community awareness and nationwide understanding on universal health coverage. When we started working on universal health coverage domain with Global Health Council, we have uh, come to know that actually people are not much aware about uh, USC. And absence of, there is an absence of migrant workers health issues in bilateral labor agreements between receiving and sending, between sending and receiving countries. Next slide, please. So based on those uh, identified uh, identified problems, we have developed our advocacy plan and the objectives are inclusion of migrants into national health and AIDS policies and related uh, migrants uh, and related services uh, for migrants to be recognized as a key population. And we are looking for the placement of uh, placement and allocation of free treatment at public hospitals for for migrant workers, and then we are looking for increased health budget and influence government leadership to achieve universal health coverage by restructuring health services and addressing the needs of vulnerable populations like drug users, sex workers, prisoners, immigrants, etc. Next slide, please. Uh, the another objective is to raise public awareness on benefits of social health protection and universal health coverage and include migrant workers health issues in bilateral agreements between sending and receiving countries. And also we want to advocate to upgrade health information system and promote elimination of treatment, elimination of treatment costs out of pocket payments by the patients. Next slide, please. So with these uh, objectives, we expect to achieve that migrant workers are recognized once we have done the implementation. Migrant workers are recognized as key population for HIV and AIDS. And there is availability of free comprehensive health check for returning and departed migrant workers with voluntary HIV testing. And there is increased availability of affordable and accessible health facilities for migrant workers and people are aware about universal health coverage, available health schemes, insurance provisions, and other services and how to access them. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, to implement, uh, to, to achieve these objectives, uh, we need to implement certain activities at the moment we are de developing a policy brief and disturbing it among key stakeholders this task is ongoing other than this we need to organize consultations with policymakers uh, such as ministry of health national aids control programs ministry of foreign affairs on universal health coverage and share our research findings and recommendations on on the areas like for the recognition of uh, 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 for the recognition of most at risk uh, key populations and include them into national HIV AIDS policies, establish special health services for returnee and deported migrants, free health checkups, including HIV testing, and include migrants' health rights in bilateral agreements between sending and receiving countries. And we also aim to uh, organize uh, advocacy meetings, consultations, awareness campaigns on mainstream and social media to increase health budgets with funds allocation for migrants and their families. Great. Yes. Thank okay, you. thank you so much. Um, 
One of the really interesting things that I think your organization did um, with the funding is do a very expansive regional, regional research on what the health needs were for migrant workers, which really led to what you wanted to focus your advocacy plan on. Um, but for those you know interested, I think Musarat, it would be great maybe in the Q and A um, to talk about how you all conducted that regional research, um, which led to you selecting this topic area for your advocacy plan. And that needs research is also really important um, as we're going into, for many of you know, there's going to be a high level meeting on universal health coverage. And it's really important for civil society to meet with ministers of health and other um, or governments that were going to be at this meeting so that they know what these gaps are and what these vulnerable populations are. So when they're talking about UHC, um, they're making commitments that directly meet the needs of those. Um, so thank you very much. Um, I am now going to go back to Clinton. So I see that I do have your presentation. Let me just pull it up now and I will share my screen. Just one moment. Thank you for coming back up, Clinton. Yeah. Okay. So give me one moment. I'm gonna now start sharing my screen. Okay, over to you. Great. Good. So um, our advocacy plan focus on advocating for Healthcare coverage of Nigerians' most vulnerable populations. Next slide. So, um, about Christian Fellowship and Care Foundation. So, we are a Nigerian registered nonprofit organization um, whose mission is to provide, you know, free uh, healthcare as well as humanitarian services in partnership with, you know, service providers, stakeholders. You know, in order to um, demand for better and improved healthcare systems, as well as realization of um, access to water and sanitation, and we do this through uh, conducting research, doing advocacy campaign, as well as you know, um, capacity building for inclusive, as well as equitable delivery of health services and realization of um, access to water and sanitation. And um, Christian Fellowship at Care Foundation has been you know, a part of, you know, the call for universal health, uh, as well as mandatory health coverage using both traditional and media as advocacy to, you know, um, to engage decision makers, as well as citizens to advocate for reforms, you know, that promotes access to quality health care. And um, for advocacy plan, um, uh, we looked at, you know, um, the current health challenges in Nigeria, most especially uh, on the issue of, you know, um, provision of health insurance um, for all citizens, because um, uh, before now, uh, the National Health Insurance Scheme was only meant to capture people in the former sector. And, you know, um, many Nigerians do not have access to this insurance, you know, from these schemes, you know, which is meant to, you know, approve funding you know, to give everybody access to. And the Nigerian government, you know, um, has been too narrow with respect to health insurance, leaving too many citizens without coverage. We also look at, you know, um, the allocation for uh, the health sector in 2022 uh, was just 4.34% um, of the entire budget, thereby falling short um, of the 15% target of Abuja declaration. During um, our advocacy uh, plan development, so we conducted the research in order to identify the gap, you know, um, in the health sectors, especially in regard to uh, health coverage. And one of, you know, uh, the uh, key issues is, you know, inadequate funding, then citizens, you know, uh, low awareness about the existence of anything like health insurance or even their health right in the first place. And we were able to conduct research in 18 states of the, uh, out of the, you know, 36 states in Nigeria, including the uh, federal capital territory. 
And um, on the uh, 19th of May, 2022, uh, President Buhari passed into, um, into law the National Health Insurance Authority, which repel uh, the, the formal law, which is the National Health Insurance Scheme, adding, thereby adding momentum to the journey towards the realization of universal health coverage in Nigeria. So for us, when this um, new law is implemented, it will help to reduce the economic impact of out-of-pocket expenses for healthcare by citizens through um, the availability you know, of health insurance for all categories of Nigeria. Again, you know, um, uh, the, the new legislation as well, you know, um, established as well as empowers, you know, the National Health Insurance Authority to ensure provision of, you know, health insurance for Nigerians through a mandatory mechanism in collaboration with state um, health agencies. Next slide, please. Go on, next slide. So um, here, you know, uh, during our research, so we, did, we identified there is, you know, uh, poor funding because um, as part of, you know, our research as well, we also conducted a debt review of the budget allocation at the federal level as well as the state level in order to be able to, to see, you know, how the funding for health sector has failed over the years. And as you can see from, you know, um, this chart, you see that, you know, that the money, the allocation, that has been allocated over the years for health has always, you know, um, fall short of the um, target of 15% of the Abuja Declaration. Next slide. So um, our advocacy plan objective, you know, the new legislation having passed into law for it to, you know, um, uh, to have any effect, there is a need, you know, to mobilize political will for the domestication of you know this law into the state law for implementation because given you know the way the um nigerian legislation is structured so there is a need you know for us to you know mobilize political will to see that you know this legislation is you know domesticated in every state in nigeria also to advocate for um, accessible as well as affordable health coverage for all nigerians you know to also you know um uh, uh, advocate for increase in health budget, you know, by 15%, most especially in order to strengthen the primary health care system. Because we believe for this new legislation to take effect, for it to be effective, for it to achieve its purpose, there is a need, you know, um, for there to be an increase in budgetary provision. And finally, you know, um, as a result of you know, our research, we also discovered there is a low level of awareness among citizens, you know, about, you know, about regard to their health rights as well as the existence of any health coverage. So part of our advocacy objective was also to, you know, um, raise awareness of this new legislation, the National Health Insurance Authority among citizens. Next. So our, our, our expected outcome um, from our advocacy plan is to see, you know, um, with the incoming government, with the new government, in the, um, with, um, by uh, 2017, to see a universal health coverage for all Nigerians, you know, to also see um, an, an increase in enrollment of people, especially people from the informal sector and vulnerable group, you know, assessing this, um, health insurance scheme, you know, to see an improvement in the health care facilities, especially in the rural areas, also to see that the uh, National Health Insurance Authority is domesticated in all the 36 states and federal capital, uh, capital territory in order to give effect to its implementation. We also um, hope to, you know, um, see um health CSOs as well as you know community network coming together to collaborate uh, in order to advocate for UHC and as well as you know um have a um a place on the table in order to make input you know to the uh, national health strategic plan and finally um we also hope to see 
an increase, especially maybe with the new administration coming on, we hope to see an increase in you know health budgetary allocation, so that you know um, the National Health Insurance Authority will be implemented. Yes. So as a final step to um, uh, moving forward from here, you, you know, um, we have been engaging with stakeholders, especially at the state level in Imo State, we have been engaging the, uh, the legislature at the you know, Imo State House of Assembly, you know, to push for the domestication of this law. You know, we have been having engagement with the budget office, you know, to call for an increase in um, in the health budget allocation. So moving forward, you know, we hope to, as part of activities, we hope to, you know, uh, secure more funding to enable us to, in, you know, engage stakeholders, you know, um, which includes, you know, um, the legislatures for uh, the scheduling of the National Health Insurance, engaging the budget office, you know, to push for an increase also engaging the um, um, the um, health management providers as well in this regard. We also, you know, look forward to you know uh, carrying out you know an intensive you know awareness creation as well as sensitization that is will be targeted at citizens. You know, using both social media, radio show programs, you know, and other material, you know, if information and communication materials, you know, to raise awareness among the citizens so that you know, they will start assessing, you know, this health coverage as well. And uh, uh, importantly, as well, is also to um, to push for uh, an increase in health budget, you know, through, you know, um, submitting citizens' budget, doing, you know, budget call, as well as budget preparation, getting the community people involved in this process. And, uh, Currently, you know, in Imo State, we have been doing that. In, in November, during the uh, Imo State budget call, we were able to mobilize some people from the communities, you know, who came during the uh, public hearings, you know, to submit, you know, uh, their community needs. And we're also working towards pushing for those needs to be included um, in the uh, state health strategic plan, as well as to see to reflect, you know, um, in the new budget that will be coming up. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. This is really great because one of the things that we talk about a lot is accountability. And it's one thing for governments to say, we commit to universal health coverage. Look, we have this great you know, national health insurance plan, but it's not enough if it doesn't reach everybody. Um, it's not enough to pass just pass legislation and, and develop these schemes if they're not reaching, especially the people um, that are most vulnerable or, or most marginalized. And so I think that this kind of work is extremely important because it's holding governments accountable to not just passing this type of legislation, but gathering the data and ensuring, you know, making sure that it's actually getting to the people. And making sure that the people actually know that it exists, which is something that, you know, you've talked about um, in your plan. So really very important work and, and thank you so much for sharing. Um, we can definitely talk about it some more in the in the Q&A. And um, as we go into our last presentation, if some of you do start, um, if you want to start uh, typing in some questions in the Q&A, you're welcome to, um, and then we can get to them after our last presentation. So last but not least, we have Arthur Onyango, who is a partner, he is uh, a partnerships and advocacy officer at the NADA Youth Organization and a population health and epidemiologist expert. So I'm going to share my screen again and hand it over to you, Arthur. You are set to go. Thank you very much. Uh, I appreciate this opportunity uh, to be able to speak to a lot of people about the work that we did courtesy of Global Health Council. Um, it was a, a project under advocacy in motion, and the goal of the project was generally to develop an advocacy action plan. And we felt it is just necessary that we retain the name advocacy in motion because it was resonating with the work that we were doing. And also the fact that we were pushing PHC as an agenda that was not greatly appreciated initially at the grassroots levels. Yes, next slide. 
So Tinode Youth Organization is a youth-led organization <laughs> that works in Western part of Kenya, and it focuses on mental health, uh, health rights, education campaigns, child youth empowerment, sexual reproductive health, and disaster risk reduction. Yes. So uh, the problem that Tinada Youth Organization was tackling and uh, which really is the backbone of our advocacy plan is less satisfactory quality of care in Kenya, particularly in Homer Bay County due to inadequate commodities and human resources and other primary health inputs. We realized that uh, uh, in primary health settings, there are fewer healthcare providers and sometimes they're not able to give the services the way uh, the communities would want. And also sometimes there are drugs talk out. So that was one of the reasons that uh, drove us even to pursue this. And uh, we also looked at limited access to quality, equitable, affordable and pr uh, primary health care services in Homa Bay County because the poor people are the, are the ones who suffer the most when it comes to uh, access to quality of care and even uh, looking at participation in terms of uh, developing quality in terms of developing policies and in terms of developing of costing, you realize that the poor are not involved yet that the people who suffer the most in terms of uh, catastrophic uh, spending. Yes. The next slide please. Okay. Just as I said, our, uh, our plan focused on uh, addressing access to quality, equitable and affordable primary health care services in Norma Bay County. And um, we looked at mobilizing political and we look at mobilizing political and administrative support to set up mechanism that, sub, uh, that support provision of quality primary health care services in Norma Bay County. We realized that uh, at the end of the day, the government has to be the one to take the administrative role. However, we realized that it's also important for the community to participate. So we also looked at providing an enabling environment for citizens to influence policy planning processes for primary health care services and also to enhance collaboration between service users, civil society organization, healthcare providers uh, to improve quality of care. This is particularly important because you realize that most often, uh, uh, and I, I may be tempted to say that this happens world over, that there are people who are considered to be working at policy level. Yes, yet there are people who are working at service delivery level who truly understand the challenges of offering services and those people who actually receive the services who truly know their need. So these two groups, if they're brought together to the table of decision making, they're able to really make sound policies if they uh, if their voices are heard so that we understand the plight of the healthcare provider and also the plight of the service user. So when the two voices come together, we would have better policies. And that is what Tinada Youth Organization looked forward to uh, when they were developing the advocacy action plan. Thank you, next slide. So we were working in one county and we still look forward to working in a home of Bay County. So one of the things that we were looking at is uh, expecting to happen is that Homer Bay County will have a, a, a legal and policy environment that ensures equity, affordability, and ensures that services are provided in a way that is satisfactory to the community. And uh, we also hope that at the end of the work that we'll do, and uh, that may be a long journey, but which we are willing to take, uh, civil society uh, have a space to participate in primary health care policy planning and enhance participation of service users in PHC policy and planning processes. And uh, just also to emphasize service users and CSOs and healthcare workers together, work together to improve uh, provision at facility level, because you realize that there are certain things that are not necessarily policy related, but they greatly influence the way services are offered. So our advocacy plan also looked at uh, providing a means for service providers and service users improving quality of care at the facility uh, without necessarily uh, interfering at uh, the policy level. And also a PHC movement is formed and holds the county government of Homer Bay accountable on equity, or equity in on quality of health care provided. And the movement members participate in highlighting the progress in, um, in highlighting the 
progress in homo babies conversation so uh that basically speaks to the tracking that uh, this movement will be able to do we look at this not being our work alone uh we think that it is much better if everyone everyone working in the space of healthcare also looks at how they can invest in advocating for primary health care in the spheres that they do for instance we work in the sphere of mental health and reproductive health but still we are resource mobilizing for these aspects of health care uh, from a primary health care perspective because you realize that these are services that people need in the community and then primary health care providers determine primary health care measures for advocacy uh, measures for advocacy and at county partnerships and policy and planning processes support service users with information to also meaningfully engage the government you realize that service users and uh, service users in kenya are given a lot of power because participation uh, of public participation processes service users are required to be able to communicate let's say generally in the uh, government planning processes the community determines what the government is investing in so it is critical that uh, the service users are involved and the only way that they can get involved is if healthcare providers tell them the gaps that exist and they also tell the healthcare providers what they need and when this discussion comes key concrete points to be used in public participation can be generated so that at the end of the day they can be included in policy. Thank you. The next slide. So, so far, we were also very lucky to have been supported by Primary Healthcare Performance Initiative, PHCPI, and we were able to uh, do some of the things that we were dreaming of in the advocacy action plan, actually bringing service providers and uh, communities to talk and uh, improve on improving quality. That is uh, the picture you are seeing is uh, actually a conversation at the community level. It's a dispensary and uh, service providers and um, healthcare champions are having a discussion and even community members are having a discussion on quality of service at their facility. So they are deciding what can be improved at the facility level and also communicating to us as advocates what we can speak of at policy level. And this was happening during the time when we were uh, participating in the county integrated development plan process. So we were lucky to have PHC concede some issues that the communities uh, thought were important for primary health care included in the county integrated development plan. Yes, the next step. Yes, the next slide. Okay. Uh, so what we are looking at is integration of PHC, and this we have done so far. We have integrated primary health care into our strategic plan that will be ending in 2027. And uh, we are also periodically gather, uh, we are also looking at periodically gathering evidence for advocacy and uh, for strengthening PHC and uh, also developing knowledge product. This is something that is in progress. Uh, through the fund, we also managed to develop some documents and uh, we can also speak about this and see how uh, they can be shared over time. And also strengthen, uh, strengthening CS1 community movement for primary healthcare alongside their traditional healthcare advocacy. We really feel that we cannot change a person from uh, talking about reproductive health, talking about uh, non-communicable diseases, but we can all speak about primary health care provision in the respective areas of our of our fields that we feel are important. And then strengthening capacity of grassroots health care providers to enable service users uh, voice their needs and be actors in policy influencing. So we really believe that the voice uh, quality, equity and accessibility and affordability can only be co-created by service providers, policy makers and uh, service users and that is what we are pushing for and uh, that is the work we are looking ahead of us so thank you very much and i'm looking forward to questions unfortunately it's raining here so it will be a little bit noisy <laughs> that's okay we actually can hear you uh very clearly so thank you so much. Uh, we were really excited when we saw um, that your advocacy plan was going to focus on primary health uh, coverage, primary health care, because we very much as a global health council support universal health coverage. And as you know, PHC is an 
very critical stepping uh, stone toward universal health coverage. Um, really exciting to see too that you're focusing on um, not just that there is primary health coverage and that people from you know the most remote areas or the most impoverished has have access to it, but also looking at the quality side of it and making sure that um, that the users feel like they're of quality, they're getting the services that they need it that they need. Um, so that was really exciting to see. And also we were obviously overjoyed that you were able to receive funding for the um, aspects of your advocacy plan. Um, and that's really what we, we wished for um, in providing these grants that, that our grantees would have the opportunity to strategically think about how they're doing their advocacy, what you want to focus on, basing that on actual data that you're able to gather at the country or regional level, and then be able to have a plan that you could show to donors, uh, funders, investors to ask, you know, this is what we're doing, this is an issue, you know, and even have them partially fund, if not fund the entire plan. So we're really happy to, to hear that you all were able to achieve this and, and thank you for sharing. We do have um, some questions um, in the audience and some are directed at specific um, at specific speakers. We have some questions, particularly on how um, your organizations can partner with other organizations, either in the region or in your countries. Um, maybe Musarat, if you can come in and maybe talk about how Karam Asia partners with other organizations across your region, um, how your organization or other organizations can get in touch with the organization to join you in some of this advocacy work. Uh, thank you, Eliana. Yes, uh, Karamisha is uh, actually a membership-based organization, and uh, we have our criteria. The organizations who are working uh, on migrant workers' issues and health and HIV areas, they can join membership, but um, there, is, there is a process to join the membership. We actually work in Asia only. We have not opened the membership in other uh, regions of the world. Within Asia, any organization working on migrants and HIV and health-related issues they can join Karamisha and uh, we have a process of uh, submitting the application which we send to the interested organizations and we get the related required information and after that there is uh, this completed in, uh, application goes to the board of directors for the discussion and if they approve the membership so we we, we allocate the uh, membership to that organization. So any organization who shares the Karamesia's vision, mission, and objectives can join Karamesia. Great, thank you. Um, I'd be interested in hearing um, from some of our other speakers about how you all partnered either with other organizations or even maybe with government to either do the research that you did to identify the problem or any other aspect of the advocacy plan. I'd be interested in hearing what partnerships you, you developed or uh, who you coordinated with to be able to uh, complete some of those steps in the advocacy planning process. Um, would anybody like to come in and, and talk about that? Yes. Yep, Clinton, go ahead. And you're welcome to come on video if you can. Okay, yeah. So um, during our research um, uh, field work, so um, like I said earlier, so we mapped out 18 states from the Tennessee states in Nigeria, including the Federal Capital Territory, and we map out these states based on the three geopolitical you know, zones here in Nigeria. And to do that, so uh, we managed to leverage, you know, on the um, um, civil society organization who already have present in these states as well as in the communities, you know, um, by, you know, uh, forming that kind of an alliance or a network, you know, and allowing them to, you know, um, be able to do the research in their own state, given that you know they understand the state more than that we do, and they understand the area more than we do, and they already have the community buy-in, you know. So and that makes the work to be more easier. Like instead of, for example, you know, our organization is based here in Imo State, in Nigeria, for us to travel to like places like Medjugorje or in order to conduct that. So we able money we manage to form these alliances with existing 
you know, organizations on the ground with community network, community-based organizations, community groups, you know, and another key thing that stood out for us during the research project that we also managed to um, get an organization of you know, joint association of persons with disability, you know, because apart from, you know, um, um, you know, the information, I mean, apart from, you know, the key issues we look at during the research, especially at the primary healthcare centers, was you know whether some of those primary health care that are the gender sensitive are the you know disability sensitive like for example you know you know um or is it accessible for you know for persons with disability and stuff things like that so and we managed to get them as part of the network as part of you know the group and allow them to you know be able to carry out the work you know, in their state as well as in their communities, and he, and at the, at the at the central level, so we also be able to bring together civil society organizations, not not just even only those working in the health sector, those working in other sectors like the human rights, accountability, and good governance. You know, those who are also working in the area of water and sanitation together to form a network. You know, um, and that was why you know when we had our CSO advocacy workshop, we were able to bring them together. To also make input, mm -hmm. you know, in you know, in our findings, you know, <clears throat> to also you know, um, be, be able to uh, you know provide some you know input in regards to maybe the data we got from the field, you know, um, so that you know we're able to um, come up with you know uh, quality data that is verifiable, uh, you know, uh, as well as that. So and uh, many of them also help. To carry out the deck review, you know, at the state budget office in various states, you know, that enable us to uh, look at, you know, um, the budget trend in right. the states as well as the federal level, because you know we're able to, you know, compare between this state and these states, you know, what is the budget level, budget al allocation in these states, this yeah. the other state as well as the federal level as well. I do, so. I do like what you said though about you know, working with the communities and working with people that already know the community and that the community trusts them. And I think that that's really important. And that's really why we always encourage government to engage with civil society because civil, civil society and communities obviously know their communities more than anyone and they already have the trust of their communities. And so if you really wanna facilitate um, being able to make, to, to implement certain um, public health policy or legislation, the best way to do it is to do it with the people that the communities trust and that they listen to. And you know, you've kind of shown that you did that in a way, even just in um, developing your your advocacy plan, working with um, communities and organizations that already have those connections. There was, thank you so much, Clinton. There was a question that I actually liked in the chat that was a lot of, that referred to lessons learned. And we don't have a whole lot of time left, but I would like um, Isaac and Arthur, since we haven't heard from you two, um, are there any lessons learned that you could share with us that you, you know, learned throughout this process, um, especially the advocacy planning process? Isaac, go ahead. Okay, great. So uh, I think uh, for a lot of the challenges, uh, we see it from the systems perspective. And if we really need to address some of these things, we need to step back and deep, uh, dig deeper into an analysis of the system to see what is working and what is not working well, and uh, come up with uh, new strategies to address the challenges. We can continue to do business as usual. We need uh, new approaches to addressing the system challenges. Wonderful. And I think that's why, you know, the process that you all used in the advocacy planning of using data and using that evidence to identify not just what the health problem is, but what change you want to make in your region or country or community um, to address that issue is so important because it's evidence-based. Um, Arthur, any any words from you on just any lessons learned from this process? Uh, the most important lesson that I learned is that quality of healthcare and even accessibility and equity cannot be determined by uh, developing policies at high level alone, they have they can be determined at the community level by making some changes in the in the facilities that requires administrative changes. So means there should be connection between facility and the service 
users. I know this can be addressed at the at, at, at policy level, but it can also uh, it can be something that we can start before policy come in place. And importantly, uh, healthcare providers, particularly primary healthcare providers, uh, in my country are left out of policy making process. So a little bit space is given to citizens and even civic groups. But these primary health care providers really also understand the challenges they face in providing quality health care. And uh, I think we learned that it is critical that we bring them to the table. We have especially them also to speak to what they would need to ensure that people receive quality health care services. Wonderful. Thank you. Yeah, the quality of health services is really important, making sure you're bringing the healthcare providers to the table, another really important point. Um, thank you so much. Our time, unfortunately, has come to an end. There, there's so much that <laughs> I wish we could continue talking about. Um, I will be sharing this recording and also um, the slides, so feel free to share it with your networks, whoever is participating. If you want others to watch and learn about this great work that they're doing, um, you're welcome to share that. Um, I really wanted to thank our very first AIM grantees because they have worked so incredibly hard to put these advocacy plans together and to really use this funding in a very um, strategic and um, useful way. And it's been a real pleasure for Global Health Council to work with each and every one of your organizations. We've learned so much. Um, we hope to continue to be able to do this um, grant work in the future, and um, we'll be sharing more information about that. Um, but for now, thank you so much for joining. And we really thank, again, our presenters and uh, these or AIM grantee organizations for your commitment and your passion um, to for health equity, um, universal health coverage, and global health in general. So thank you, and we'll be in touch with the webinar recording. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye, Eliana. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye, Eliana. Bye.